Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. It's really great to see such a wonderful turnout of local people for our local history event on the history and associations of Birdsland, a place which is dear to very many people's hearts. I think dear and passionately protected. First of all, I would like to give an acknowledgement to the Wurundjeri people, the first users of the land. And having said that, to say that they are not the focus of this talk. The focus of this talk are the, the early European settlers and leading up to the modern time as well. Um, there's nothing like bird's land to calm the nerves and raise the passions. It seems to have equal measures of serenity, controversy and tragedy. Many in this audience are very knowledgeable on bird's land, but we can only have so many speakers, and I know that there is a wealth of knowledge here. Um, today's speakers have first-hand knowledge with this land, and the speakers are Marion Preston, Betty Marsden and Kelly O'Brien. I'll introduce them separately. And I'm Judy Wolfe, the local history librarian for Belgrade. We'll hear about the early history of settlers in neighbouring properties, um, the, the courageous purchase of the land by the Shire of Sherbrooke and the development of the reserve since its purchase, as well as dramas, both man-made and natural. But given um, our time frame, they will, they will be snapshots. The library keeps a local history collection of monographs and clippings, which complement the resources available in our local wonderful historical societies. Um, amongst many people, I'm pleased to have um, one of the Bird family in the audience, Brian Bird, grandson of, of the Bird family. <laughs> and other long-time residents, Jim Chips, just here. Yeah. I'd like to introduce Marion Preston. Um, Marion Preston is the genesis of this talk today. Um, we had a phone call discussion about some overdue library books. <laughs> and one thing led wonderfully to another. When I realised she had all local history books out and she lived on Nixon Road and I said, you must be the only person who lives on Nixon Road. And she said, I am. <laughs> and I thought, this is local royalty. <laughs> um, and she spoke about people that she has liaised with, um, elderly people about local history and she said we need to hear from these people when, while we still can yes, yes. and I completely agreed. So Marion and her husband Barry Preston and their family live on the farm in Nixon Road just off Glenfern Road and um, she is a great uh, researcher. Um, she's done an enormous amount of research in this topic. She's not a professional speaker so she's going to use notes, but she's extremely well prepared. Um, and she has a lot of content to cover. We've tried to keep it as brief as possible. We have a handout which has more detail in it, um, but please bear with us because so many things are interconnected. So would you please welcome Marion Preston. I grew up in Belgrave Heights and now live on Nixon Road on a hill above the Mombol Creek. It's a hobby of mine to delve into the lives of the very early settlers who came to live in the valley of the Mombol Creek. Their stories are of hardship, vision, tragedy and overcoming. Most came from Ireland and England, the Irish escaping the dreadful potato famine and religious persecution. They were prepared to work hard and live with conditions and tragedies we find difficult to imagine. Our focus today is on the early settlers of neighbouring pieces of land. The property that is now Birdsland Reserve, owned by the two Ryan brothers, Patrick and James. Land across the creek, owned by Henry Morris and his descendants, and their neighbour, Thomas Dorgan. You may know Thomas Dorgan from Dor Dargan's Track, a pretty track starting at the retaining wall beyond the lakes. Thomas Dorgan held this land when it was the Mombok run prior to subdivision and subsequently bought part of it. What is a pastoral run? <coughs> a run is a large area of crown land, so called at that time wastelands, 
leased on a yearly basis with restrictions. It was simply to pasture sheep and cattle. No crown land could be sold until it had been properly surveyed. The Mombok Run encompasses land now known as Listerfield, Narrewarren East to, to Belgrave near the Trestle Bridge, South Belgrave and Belgrave Heights. Bounded by the creek with a two mile frontage draining into then swamplands along the Listerfield Valley. We'll talk about the first tragedy of the Dorgans. In 1850, the Mombok lease was taken up by Thomas Dorgan, who is credited with naming the run after hearing Aborigines saying, Mombok, Mombok, supposedly meaning hiding place in the hills. In 1856, after it was surveyed, Thomas Dorgan purchased 160 acres from the run by preempted empty right, being his homestead portion. That same year he married Margaret Mary Cale, a newly arrived Irish lass from his homeland. They had three children, Delia, Blanche and John. The Dorgans lived off site at Gardner's Creek. They were doing well, with other properties at Collingwood, Cooyongkoot Creek and Narry Warren, and there were possibly others. In May of 1862, riding home to Gardner's Creek after inspecting his properties and businesses, Thomas Dorgan called into the Umemering Hotel for refreshment, enjoying a few brandies, so the inquest records say, and on departing was a bit worse for the drink. But he also said he could mount his horse and sit well in his saddle. While attempting to cross the flooding Dandenong Creek, Thomas Dorgan was caught in a swift flowing current and swept downstream. He and his horse were drowned. No one knew of his fate until three days later when a stockman discovered his body and saddle among some branches. A devastating loss to his young wife. The same year, their third child, John, was born. And this happened in May. This tragedy was the beginning of a heartbreaking chain of events for his family. Thomas Dorgan had not made a will, thus bringing complications for his widow, Margaret. Although he owned much land, it was all tied up, and the following year, Margaret was declared insolvent. In an effort to maintain her family, Margaret Dorgan moved to the Mombok homestead to live and run the cattle business, an enormous undertaking for a young woman with three small children. She must have been a strong, positive woman to take this on. But did she have any choices? I don't think so. The second tragedy was the cattle. More tragedy and hardship came within a two year period, 1863 to 64. The herd of cattle cont contracted pleura pneumonia, a highly contagious disease of the lungs. The procedure was that for this disease, all animals must be quarantined, shot and the carcasses burnt, along with all the implements, chains, harnesses, and even the workers' clothing burnt also. Further to that, all the bullocks and horses used to haul the carcasses were also shot and burned. So somebody else lost their living. The third tragedy, the children. Worse was yet to come, when shortly after losing her cattle and livelihood, Mrs. Dorgan's two youngest children, Blanche five and John, now three, died 10 days apart, suffering diphtheria. This is according to Helen Coulson. This poor woman had two funerals in a very short time, but not together. It must have been so difficult for this woman of sorrows to continue. She must have felt cursed. Mrs. Dorgan and her now only daughter, Delia, was aged eight, continued to live at the homestead, though with what income, I do not know. Finally, a change of fortune for her. It is a relief to discover that happiness came to her two years later when Robert Nixon, 
who was looking to purchase land in the area, called at her home on the Mombol Creek asking for directions. He must have been such a charismatic man, as it is recorded he loved dancing, even performing reels of the Tivoli. He was an accomplished wrestler and a boxer, and they married in 1867. Her new husband, Robert Nixon, bought the adjacent large pro property to the east of Dorgan's land, and later more land on both sides of Wellington Road. The Nixons had one child, Isabella, born in 1871. At that time, Robert Nixon became politically involved, serving on the Berwick Council and later as a found foundation councillor of the Ferntree Gully Shire, formed in 1889. He only served 12 months, for he died the next year in 1890. Robert Nixon also died without making a will. <laughs> Margaret Nixon, twice widowed, died seven years later at the homestead on Mombol Creek. Also, incredibly, without a will. <laughs> Both Robert and Margaret Nixon are buried in Ferntree Gully Cemetery. Then we'll talk about the Brants. In 1902, 12 years after her father's death, and she was 31, Isabella Nixon married a German sailor, Alfred Brandt, who had, been already, who had already been working on the property since 1888. He was employed by her father. And he came to Australia on wind jammers. He was a carpenter, and that's how he arrived. Together they raised three children, Otto, Julius, and William. Now, Isabella was a very beautiful woman, and we've got a photo of her. Yes. Um, and we've got a photo of Mrs. Dorgan. Um, oh, that's okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Very poor photo. But... That's Isabella and Mrs. Dorgan. So she was known as the belle of, of the area, because she was very, very beautiful. Isabella had a long life, and she lived at the Mombog homestead for most of those years. At age 87, the final family tragic occurred in 1958. Isabella Brandt died in a fire that destroyed her home, the original Dorgan homestead named Mombok, scene of so many tragedies. The remains of the homestead can still be seen on Dargan's track. The site is largely covered by weeds and rambling roses. But remnants of the fireplace, the orchard and well across the track can still be seen. When you pass this homestead, please pause and think about the people who lived in this quiet, lonely and sad place. And now we'll talk about the Rhines and Birdsland. Let us move to the neighbouring land now named Birdsland. Around the time Dorgan bought his land, Two brothers, Irish, Patrick and James Ryan, came to the area. Patrick Ryan was the first to buy with his business partner, Patrick Callanan. They purchased 137 acres west of Nixon Road, and he and his wife, Bridget, and their three children lived on the property beside the creek. The property was named Fernvale. It's now Burnbray. Patrick's brother, James Ryan, selected 80 acres upstream, now part of the current site of Birdsland. He built a small dwelling of stones and timber. Clearing the land, he planted potatoes, raised pigs and bred turkeys that roamed in the bush, rounding them all up with dogs before taking them to market at Dandenong. Jane's wife was the local midwife who delivered 10 babies of her neighbour, Mrs Best who lived up the hill on Mount Morton. She herself had six children, even giving birth to twins born in a wagon on the road to Oakley. <laughs> Mrs Ryan lived on the property in most difficult conditions for 40 years. I do not know her first name, and if anyone knows, can you please tell me later? because looking up Ryan's in public records is big business. <laughs> Brother Patrick also purchased the 80 acres above James's land, 
but he never lived there. For the same year he purchased, he was killed while returning from Melbourne, steering his spring cart along Glenfern Road, Ferntree Gully. The wheel clipped a stump on the road. Overturning his cart, Patrick was thrown out and killed. The coroner wrote a scathing letter to the Berwick Roads Board informing them of the conditions of the road, full of stumps and being difficult to negotiate. It was really only a track. Patrick's widow, Bridget, married his partner, Cullinan, four years later, and they continued to live on the first property, Fernvale. However, she died two years into the marriage. On his brother's death, James Ryan took ownership of both parcels of land, creating the 160-acre property we now know today as Birdsland. The other neighbour was Henry Morris. On the north side of the Mombog Creek was Henry Morris, a bullocky, after whom Morris Road is named, who bought 80 acres in 1872. And that's the land that I live on. He sold this original selection and purchased 320 acres, encompassing both sides of the Glenfern Ridge, where he built a solid English-styled home with an attic roof. He named his property View Hill Farm. The house is still there, but is now known as Alawira. Part of Henry Morris's land on the north side of the creek is now part of the Birdsland Reserve. After several subsequent owners, the final private owners of Birdsland were the Bird family, Hector and Evelyn Bird, who bought the property in the 1940s and used it for cattle and hay. And Brian's here, grandson Brian is here with us today. They did not live here, rather in Narry Warren, on a larger property over there, and they visited every three days. And I remember Mr. and Mrs. Bird. She was a tiny lady who had an E.H. Holden, a lovely green one. <laughs> and she was about my height, I reckon. <laughs> I thought I should be able to drive a car like that too. Anyway, compulsory acquisition. Mombog Creek used to flood regularly into the Dandenong Valley. With the development of the Roval area in Scoresby, this flooding needed to be eased. So in 1966, the Dandenong Valley Authority announced that it would compulsorily acquire land beside the creek to build a retarding basin. And we've got a photo of the retarding basin at some stage. <laughs> These being the creek flats of the original Morris land by then owned by his descendants, the Chicks brothers, and we've got Jim here. Fred Preston, the Bird family, and Mrs Mould, who owned the old Nixon property. The loss of their most fertile land and the creek frontage to water their cattle was a devastation that eventually went ahead around 1972. The 1970s leads us to another era which will be covered by Betty Marsden. In con conclusion, let me relate a personal story. Some 10 years or so ago, after my family had been chasing our neighbour's cows back across the creek, I stayed behind. It was late afternoon, very quiet, cold and muddy, and I was enjoying the solitude. The sun came out, the shadows grew long, and then an eerie breeze came up the valley as the sun disappeared. I knew the story of the Dorgan children's death and of Mrs Isabella Brant's demise. I felt apprehensive and my imagination went into overdrive. I left as quickly as I could struggling along the muddy track. From that day on I became fascinated by the people who lived in this quiet place, particularly Mrs Dorgan. I think about her story of happy beginnings, un unimaginable tragedies, unexpected good for fortune at a desperate time, her devotion to Robert Nixon, who brought, brought ease and security into her life again, and another child. I am glad she did not know the fate of her last child, Isabella, who died in the very house she came to as a young woman to Mombog Creek 
when it burnt to the ground 93 years later. I have written a copy of this talk with more detail and for those of you who wish to take it and a separate section on Alfred Brandt. Thank you. Marion, thank you very much. That was an amazing story and incredibly well researched. Marion has looked at inquests, wills, well, there aren't too many wills, <laughs> letters, letters of administration, um, newspaper articles. She's done amazing research over, over some years and it's all coming out today. So thank you very much for that. Our second speaker um, this afternoon is Betty Marsden, whom probably everybody in this room must know, uh, former Shire President of the Shire of Sherbrooke. It was Betty and Michael Buxton and some, uh, some of the other councillors of the Shire who decided or, and committed and drove the courageous purchase of Bird's Land when it was, um, when it was for sale. Um, and shortly after that, Betty became Shire President. Betty has continually worked all these years with strong association to Birdsland and, as we know, with champions many environmental causes. She's president of the Save the Dandenongs League. I think the Gardens Trust. A member of that. A member of the Gardens Trust. And an indefatigable um, environmental warrior. Please welcome Betty Marsden. So I joined in 1981, I was asked, I got involved with Save the Dandenongs League and then I was asked to stand for council. It was a bit of an environmental push in those days and I was very hesitant about doing it and I remember agreeing to do it and then thinking, having terrible cold feet and thinking, what on earth have I done? Uh, but anyway, I stuck it out and uh, I was actually elected three times unopposed, so that was something. Um, but we had... Um, we gradually, the environmental people got the upper hand, you could say, in the council in that time, and we were able to make decisions. It was a very fortunate time because, um, looking back, I think it's one of the best times to have been on council because we were able to buy some land, not only Bird's Land, but there are other small blocks and other places that were bought because land was cheap then. Uh, and you wouldn't be able to buy any of it now. In fact, if they just look at you blankly if you even even mention it to any of the councillors because it's, it's just so expensive, it's not, not an option. But then it was, fortunately. And we also had uh, things to do with planning schemes and trying to make, um, make the best decisions to accommodate what residential development there would be, but try and do it in a way that was... Um, fitted in with the landscape. So anyway, I joined in 1981. If I could give you one little personal anecdote about my interest in bird's land, uh, my, my oldest boy, Christopher, um, was about nine, I think, when we first came here. And uh, two or three years, probably a couple of years later, he got permission, one of his friends, or I understand he's got permission, I don't suppose I ever knew officially. Uh, one of his friends had permission for Mr. Bird to fish in the creek, that's what we were told. And he arranged for, for uh, Chris to also be able to go there. And so they used to go down there, I think my husband took him sometimes and the other boy's friend took him. And they used to go down there and I hadn't seen the place. And uh, we used to do Sunday afternoon drives and this particular Sunday we went for a drive and we must have gone down McNichol Road. And uh, I hadn't been there. We'd only lived there two, a couple of years or something like that. And we drove down the hill. I was in the back seat with Johnny and Chris was in the front seat with his father. And we drove down McNichol Road. And as you know, if you know, if you're going to Birdsland, you drive down that road and you come to the point where you see Birdsland, the creek and the trees and that lovely green valley. And I've always uh, loved fine landscape. And I remember sitting up and saying, oh, this is beautiful. Where's this? <laughs> and Chris turned around with a sort of a 
superior attitude and he said, that's birds padded, mum. Uh, and I've never forgotten that, or that that was my introduction to Birdsland. And um, I've loved it ever since. So anyway, it was around that time that before I got on council, that Mr. Bird, I think, was wanting to retire, and they didn't have the use for the, uh, they wanted to, I suppose, um, reduce some of their land holdings. Um, there was actually Jonathan King, who's quite well known, more in Sydney than here. He was the man that got the bright idea, the historian, of the first fleet, of the reenactment of the first fleet in 1988 from England. His, his aunt's direct ancestor was Philip Gidley King, and he was very conscious of that. It was a wonderful undertaking, but unfortunately he fell out with Bob Hawke, and I think he never got the recognition for the whole thing because he did part of the journey and everything. Uh, but anyway, he, he'd lived in the, in the house, the actual uh, main farmhouse at Birdsland for about seven years, he and his wife and children. Um, and we got to know them. They were uh, interested in the property and they would have liked to have bought it, but they would have liked us to subdivide a, a bit out and let them have the house and we weren't prepared to do that. So at this stage, Mr. Bird wanted to do something about his property and um, the, the Shire, it, it had a, what we called an old and inappropriate subdivision on it. That meant there was a, had been a proper subdivision done, but it had never been taken up. But quite small allotments on that creek frontage and up to where the house was. And it, it, would, have, it would have ruined the place, but by the same token, uh, they had a perfect right to see what they could do with it. And I remember, um, there were hamlets talked about at that stage. They had some hamlets. Uh, was brought in as a pl planning scheme tool, and it was taken out again within about three years. But it didn't work. But um, that was Birdsland was one of the ones that they thought of doing, where you'd take up a certain amount of small, um, s small allotments with houses, some public open space along the creek, and. Um, and a primary allotment that you could not, not uh, subdivide in the future. Um, and there was two of the, the Cams wanted to do something with their land about that time, and so there was their land and the land small allotted opposite Butterfield Reserve, uh, and that's, that was Bob Cams, and that's the only one of the hamlets that worked. And there's someone, I won't say the person's name, but someone who's a wildlife carer and uh, cares about native animals got the primary allotment on that land and about 50 acres a number of years ago. And that's the only one that worked. But the other two, the consultants came in and did plans and we were a bit horrified when we saw them. Uh, and it was advertised and I was secretary of Save the Dandenongs League then. This is about 1978 or 79. And uh, I put in an objection. Uh, which I have still got, but the last time I, I found it, I put it away for safekeeping, and now I can't find it, of course. <laughs> but I was, one of the things I said when, towards the end of the letter was that if the money could be found, I felt it would, should be purchased, um, because it was such a... It was a miracle that it had survived in, its state, in that state up until that time. Uh, there was a creek... There was bushland on, on one of the hills just inside the front gate. Uh, there was the lovely creek and this had managums going along the creek. Uh, it was just the topography. It's between Upway and Belgrave Heights or South, whichever. Um, sort of lo like lungs. It's this beautiful creek valley. And it seemed a shame to, but it had lasted that long as it was, a shame to spoil it. Anyway, that was that. I wasn't on council then, and I did say to one of the councillors, although I don't even know whether it went any further than what I said to her, um, they were looking at Jorgensen. At about that time, Jorgensen's property was up for sale because Dr. Jorgensen had died, and they were interested in that. But it was a, it's a lovely property, but it's probably got its best use as it is now. But we looked at it. The, the council did look at it. But I remember saying, when this talk about Birdsland and saying to this councillor, if you got that sort of money, forget about forget about Jorgensen's buy Birdsland. 
or Bird's Farm, whatever I called it. Now, I don't know whether that had any, any influence, but when I stood for council in 1981, uh, councillors Michael Buxton and Frank Reed had already had some sort of preliminary discussion with, with Mr Bird, Hector Bird, um, as to whether there could be some sort of, um, you know, whether we could purchase it. So when I got on council, I fully supported that, and so did Margaret Douglas, who was the South Riding Councillor then, and Frank Reed was the South Riding Councillor, and we eventually got Jeff Butler, the third South Riding Councillor. They all supported buying it. Michael Buxton and myself made five, and then there was, um, who was that, five, three, four, five, you know, one more, that's right, John Canor was the other one, he was the Emerald Councillor. Um, so anyway, the discussions were on whether or not to buy Bird's Land, if Mr Bird would come at a price that, that, that we could manage and that he would be happy with. And I'd like to pay tribute to Hector Bird because I believe that they probably could have got more money with it elsewhere and in other ways, but he, he really did like the idea of, of the Shire buying it and having it for public open space. And so I think he was quite accommodating and didn't drive as hard a bargain as he might have. Anyway, um, the council was really split on it. Funnily enough, the ca several council conservation councillors weren't in favour of buying it, mainly because they believed we'd never be able to manage it. It was too big and the council didn't always do that good a job of managing land, etc., etc. And I said, well, um, where there's a will, a cliche, I suppose, but still, where there's a will, there's a way. If you really want to, if people are sufficiently interested in it, we'll be able to manage it. And there were a number of, the league, say the Danlons League supported buying it, so did a number of local residents and other people, South Riding people. And I don't even know all the ones who did because, dare say, some of them expressed their opinions to their individual councillors. So when it came to a vote in, uh, I think it was October 1981, um, and I think the price, I, can't, I was reading it the other day, but I haven't bought that with me. I think it was 175,000. You can't, money's meaningless looking back because what sort of prices land brings now. Um, but it was something like that, I think, 170 odd acres. Um, and when the night the vote came, it was really split 6-6. Six, six. And Jeff Edwards, who was a very caring conservation person, but he didn't think we could manage it. He wasn't really in favour of buying it. But the funny thing, or peculiar thing, was that he was struck down with appendicitis, which in a way was, was a, in some ways a bit fortunate because he couldn't come to the meeting. He was in hospital. And so we had 6-5. And I think that made it, it was a bit easier to do because if Jeff had been there and voted against it, then it would have been a split vote and Frank Reed, who was president at that time, would have had to use his casting vote. And it's rather hard, I think, to, to buy something like that on a casting vote. So with 6-5, we agreed, and Ken Matson used to, not going to buy that place, are you? You know, he was very worried about it all. However, I just felt it was my thoughts were that it was, you get a chance, you just sometimes only get one chance in a lifetime um, for something like that. And that land, if it had been sold, they'd have got a compromise because Mr. Bird wouldn't have wanted to buy, build all the houses that uh, were proposed in the Hamlet, but they would have had to build some because obviously that's what would have happened. And it, it, would, have been sh it would have been gone, once it's gone, it's gone forever in that instance. And so that was the time we had the opportunity to do that and to, to ch change history or keep it as it was, and that's what we chose to do. And I just had the f belief that it would be. It was such a beautiful property with those creek flats, the lovely trees along the creek, the bushland, the big hill, which you can go up on the big hill up to Ryan's Road and see the marvellous view, and the, and the retarding basin. That was one of the things I had written down here, which I haven't really r read yet. But um, the retarding basin, which Marion referred to, was when the Dandenong Valley Authority built that retarding basin in the 70s. And I just say to people, 
And don't forget that there was a Dandenong Valley Authority because now Mel Melbourne Water infer that they built it. And they didn't, because they didn't exist then. Um, it was, the state had these small water boards all over the place. Some of them weren't very efficient, uh, but Dandenong Valley Authority was. I, I was fortunate to be chosen as, as a Shire's Commissioner, uh, which was a representative on that uh, authority. And there was 18 councils. There was the Dandenong Creek and its tributaries. And there were 18, 18, I think it was 18 councils that were on it. And we each had one councillor. And I had a very high regard for the Dandenong Valley Authority. They were engineers, they were very caring and um, into new engineer, soft engineering techniques. And uh, they, they used to say, well, the primary, primary purpose of those lakes was flood retarding, as Marion said about uh, um, Scoresby area, the flooding, and I think even further down to Dandenong, there used to be flooding. And uh, that was to mitigate that, but as a secondary purpose, it could be, um, it was for um, uh, conservation and recreation. And so um, having those lakes there, which had once been, some of it been part of that property and, and been uh, resumed, um, it was appropriate that then it's all, it's not actually managed as one, but it is in a sense because um, they cooperate. The Danong Valley used to cooperate, and unfortunately, I think, um, I can't remember who I blame for it now, whether it was John Kane or Jeff Kennett. It was either one. Uh, one of them, because one of them, Kennett did amalgamations, um, but then John Kane scooped that, so, you know. Uh, and we weren't happy with amalgamations, but still. But somewhere in that vicinity, um, they abolished all those water boards, and and Melbourne Water was one of the, uh, the that was set up. Um, the, the, the way the water's handled now was sort of done around that, some around uh, 1990, I think it was about then. So I'm not quite sure now which particular government did that. But I was very sad that the Danong Valley Authority was wiped out then because, and as someone said to me who lived on the, one of the creeks down there, we used to see any floods or anything, we always saw Danong Valley Authority. She said, now that we've got Melbourne water, we never see them. So that was rather interesting. But, um, so I wanted to pay that tribute to the Danong Valley Authority. Um, when we decided to buy the property, um, the, the money, of course, the press got onto it and made a big song and dance. And uh, da Jeff Edwards, that's why I want to pay a bit of tribute to him, that's two I've done. Uh, Jeff Edwards was a councillor, and while he didn't support buying it, when we did buy it, he threw himself behind trying to make it work. And uh, he was there until 1986. And Jeff was, he had a, a, quite a good job. He was at Gells Park. He was a, a scientific person, a technical person. And he was able to talk to, to I suggested he talk to them and he did, could do more than I could do with the DVA because he could talk technical stuff and more than I could have. And uh, he got, um, between us, we got money out of the Danong Valley Authority towards the price. They made, some of the land was flood prone and so they put a, a price on that. And uh, they also contributed, they got a, a, some sort of a scheme, one of those Commonwealth schemes um, that put land in, money in, and they built the, um, the toilet block and the picnic area with the little rotunda and the fencing and that sort of thing. So they, they paid for that, or some of it was this, that scheme. So the Dandenong Valley Authority, they had a Monbog Creek Committee, which I was on actually, uh, they worked in with, and they took on birds land as well. So up till that was all abolished, until then they helped look after birds land, because um, it, it was quite a big thing to get a property like that open to the public. Um, the other thing, of course, was before we got very far, uh, the Ash Wednesday fires happened in February 1983, and and it was arson, even the, in, the inquiry said that, um, and no one was ever charged. There was a story about the two little boys 
being seen running from the place, they may or may not have, have started the fire. Because as I said to somebody, if you wagged it from school and you were down at Birdsland and, uh, and you looked around and there was smoke or a fire coming, you would run off the property anyway. So whether they lit it or whether it was anyone else, we don't know, but it was supposedly lit somewhere near the front gate and took off because the, perhaps the Shire hadn't been quite uh, good enough with their fire clearance. In German Gully, there was a lot of blackberries in German Gully and it shot up the up there and into South Belgrave. So that was a setback. But um, anyway, it was after that that we formed a working group for Birdsland that I took on being chairman and Jeff Edwards was on that as well. I'm not sure about Mar no, Margaret Douglas's house was burned out in Ash Wednesdays and that sort of, she was up for re-election and she didn't stand again. That knocked Margaret around, it was very unfortunate um, because she was a very good person and very genuine in her concern for people and the environment both. Um, so anyway, this and we had Graham Duff as the as the Shire's engineer, uh, and probably one or two others. But uh, and Graham, and that was the other person I wanted to mention, because Graham Duff uh, was a tremendous person as far as the administration went. He was always helpful. He worked lots of hours beyond what he was paid to do. I always found if I um, asked him to do anything, he always did it. And um, he was a big help to me with advice about that property. Uh, and uh, we made the decision to have a, a tenant in the, in the ha farmhouse and we advertised and that was when we got Margaret and Ron Lewis. They weren't the only ones, but they were by far the best candidates and they actually took up residence there in, uh, towards the end of 1983. And they were a young couple with two little girls. And Margaret, um, particularly, she was a farmer's daughter. And her parents were well off, well off farmers, I think, in the Riverina. And Margaret has said to me once, uh, her father, she had, he didn't have any sons, he had two daughters. And she said, and he expected us to work like men on the farm. And she was tremendously competent and she loved it. And it was in her blood. She loved doing it. So she was, a, they took up residence. Unfortunately, they spent too much money helping fix up the house. And there was always a bit of um, <clears throat> angst about that, I think. But um, uh, she, as far as work went, she, she set up the, uh, she got the school programs going. I bought one of her Birdsland Reserve, and it was a report that she, got, that she wrote for the committee if anyone wanted to look after it. After it's got pictures and all sorts of things. They, um, she did this in 1989, that was when they wanted the lease extended. Um, they used to have children there, schools in there, um, just, they went, you know, tadpoling and going down to the lakes and that sort of thing. And she got, um, had baby animals. They used the barn, which was, the barn was more or less where the education centre is now. Um, they had, she always had a, she had a draft horse. I think she had a pony occasionally. Um, <clears throat> they, had, uh, they had pigs at one stage, they had baby pigs. They had ducklings and geese and other baby animals. I wonder, have I got a drink of water anywhere? Right beside you. Beside you, Betty. Right beside you. Okay. Um, so she got those, all those, she liked the idea of teaching children about farm animals. So I wanted to mention her because it was things like that that got the place going. That uh, um, her hard work and her her vision and enthusiasm, she used to do a newsletter, she got in touch with the local schools. That's where it started. And, uh, and then we had the, we worked out the hours that they could, had to be closed on days of total fire ban. We were definite about that. And that's still the case. Um, and uh, they used to open up at a certain time in the morning and close the gates at night, etc. But But the Lewises were good tenants and Margaret was exceptional. So that was, 
that went on until I had a five-year lease, so that finished in 1989, and I resigned from council uh, in 1988. Um, so I wasn't there when the decision was made because I would have supported them to get another lease. But I think that was the, the people that I wanted to thank and comment on, I think I mentioned were Margaret Lewis, Graham Duff, and um, the Dandenong Valley Authority. Was there somebody else? Um, Hector Bird, the Bird family, but Hector in particular, because of, uh, I felt, his uh, generosity and accommodating manner that he was willing to consider the, the purchase of the property. I don't think anybody today would say that it was the wrong decision. Um, yeah, and the other person that I would mention is Kelly O'Brien, who became the caretaker. She's going to talk to us. I won't take up what Judy's going to say. But anybody knows that property. Kelly knows it better than anyone. And um, I've had a great relationship with Kelly. So there's been some wonderful people that have cared about Birdsland. And because of that, and the fact it's the best kept secret, people don't want you to just, tell just other just people about it. <laughs> <laughs> but, tell the no. I think that, I'll leave it at that. Thank it's you. Too late now. I think you have the respect and gratitude of the whole community at this end of the Shire for that courageous move in 1982 yes. when you put your reputation on the line. Yeah. Our next speaker is Kelly O'Brien. Kelly works for the Shire of Yarra Rangers, then the Shire of Sherbrooke. Um, she has been and is has been the resident caretaker, is now the caretaker, lived on the property for seven years, knows her horses inside out and knows the land inside out. Um, she works for in the Department of um, Bushcraft and Trails currently. Um, Kelly's going to talk about the, the development of Bird's Land under Shire Care, um, its, its uses, its associations, its dramas, um, and we'll have a bit of a PowerPoint going while she, while she speaks. Uh, so please welcome Kelly. Um, all right. Well, just as a bit of a background, um, I've been involved with Birdsland Reserve since 1989, which is 25 years, which is a bit scary to find out when I started writing things down. It just felt like only just a few years ago. Um, my association began with um, when I began adjusting my horses there um, many years ago and I was also working with the then Shire of Sherbrooke in the Conservation and Recreation Department um, when that um, bird's lamp was part of that area. I was there until amalgamation in December 1994. Um, I left the Shire then and came, in 2001 I came back and was employed as the caretaker for the reserve and I lived in the cottage until 2008 just before the fires. I still work there based from um, Birdsland with the Bushland and Trails team um, and working in the south of the Shire. A big part of my role over the years has been overseeing the horse adjustment, which is, was my area of expertise coming in, um, and which continues the historical use of the farm of, of farming. So on the education side, yeah, I worked in the education centre with Donna, working with education programs, but it started with the Lewis family, as Betty said. They were the original lessees when the Shire purchased the property. And among other things, yeah, they ran an education program from the old barn, uh, which is on the site of the present um, nursery and education centre. I've met people, ex-teachers and students from Tacoma, who have told me about coming to visit. Um, prior to amalgamation, the old barn was condemned and pulled down, and the new education centre was built and opened in 2000. But the po focus has changed over time from a farm experience to environmental education. Oh, the stables are there, which is sort of a part of the old farming legacy. Yep, I used to assume I had my horses shot under that old carport thing there. Yeah. yeah so. oh, all right, so and then we to the wetland. Yep, there. The wetland below the education centre, and that's in its very early days there, was built by Melbourne Water. The boardwalk across the wetland was built by Melbourne Water and Yarra Rangers Council to link the education centre to the wetland and the reserve, wonderful resources for the school groups. Carolyn Cavallo worked with Melbourne Water and Yarra Rangers Council to get the funding and the work done for that boardwalk. Who's in the picture here? Oh, that's Councillor Dunn. The wetland was an important habitat for swamp wallabies and other fauna after the fires. 
wildlife carers work for weeks thereafter the fires rescuing animals. Oh, the fires. Fires have been a major part of the history of Birdsland and had a big impact on the reserve. Um, Ash Wednesday was a bit before my time, but it was in 1983 and was identified as the source of one of the many fires at that time. And as we know, there's many rumours to how it started, and I'm sure you've all heard of many of them, including arsonists and boys smoking rabbits. I'm sure we can add to the list. Ultimately, it changed the way the reserve was managed. Um, for February in 2009, we had fires again, and it was a total fire ban day. I started really early and finished at 1pm. I found out not long after that Birdsand was on fire, but I couldn't get back into the reserve until very early the next day. The picnic ground below Gemma Gully was on fire, as was behind the house and the bush beyond. All the horses were OK, tired and sweaty, but no injuries, and all our buildings were still there. I was worried for quite a while about the Oxfam trail walkers that were in the park on that day, even though it was a day of total fire ban. I kept waiting to hear in the news that some bodies were found, but they were OK in the end. There were huge fire breaks graded around the fires, which were monitored by fire trucks. The grader lines were difficult to rehabilitate as the ground was hydrophobic afterwards. We lost over three kilometres of fencing, but the positive, we needed one after all that fire and damage to the bush and wildlife, is that large tracts of bone seed and potosporum were burnt and destroyed. When the bone seed seed sprouted, we could spray and now the weed is under control in the reserve, at least one weed is. Um, Oh, no, we haven't got a really good picture. But another big impact on the reserve we have is floods. In recent years, we've had a number of flood events. I've seen the water up to the top of the wall. Um, one memory I have is of riding my horse around the lake to check, and we ended up swimming at the back end down below Marion's because the water was so deep. There's been a lot of damage from water that rises fast and deep, knocking down fences, damaging bridges and leaving debris. It also causes problems with erosion. The floods in combination with the drought and fire have had a huge impact on the platypus population in the creek. Other nursery. We have a not-for-profit community nursery based at Birdsland. It began in 1995 following the closure of the Shire of Sherbrooke's Indigenous Nursery. And just on by the by, it's open Tuesday 9 to 4, 30, Friday 9 to 1 and Sundays 9 to 1. Come and see Leslie, our wonderful nursery manager. She can give you great advice on plants and weeds. She's a wealth of knowledge, one that's a great help to me. The Southern Ranges Environmental Alliance facilitator is based in the Education Centre, as well as the Southern Dandenong's Landcare Group, who run the Mini Beast Festivals at Birdsland each year. I wish there was more time to talk about the great work they're doing, but it is Weed Busters month, Beast, well, Weed Busters month, and they're doing a presentation here at the library next Thursday. Come along and see them. <laughs> um, the largest user group of the reserve actually is the public who come to walk run, picnic, orienteering, bird walking, fishing, or bird watching, sorry, fishing, photographing, um, exercising their dogs, among other things, to utilise and appreciate the wonderful space that is Bird's Land. It has also been used as a film set for Against the Wind and other small movies and ad campaigns, as well as inspiration for the Ballad of Bird's Land and the Fire Cycle. Um, about the future. Uh, the master plan went to council this year is a guide to the future for the reserve, a framework for getting funding. Um, if you've visited recently, you'll have seen the boardwalk to improve the safety of pedestrians and cyclists entering the reserve, separating them from the clash between vehicles and pedestrians, and improved signage is on the way. Um, uh, Judy um, asked me to say what it, it's important to me, and uh, for Birdsland, it's really the little things, um, my main memories, like... Um, riding through the back and being surrounded by butterflies, finding a wallaby in the bush. It's those little special moments. Um, I'm very also appreciative, and it's also people um, walking the park and tell me how much they've enjoyed the reserve and the space. Oh God, I'm shaking like a leaf. I'm <laughs> even finished. Um, I'm very appreciative of the fact that Betty and the councillors had the foresight to purchase this special space that we can all enjoy which is the lungs of Belgrave and the Dandenongs and an important environmental link for the future. <laughs> certainly a very emotional place, Birdsland. <laughs> um, that concludes our presentations. Um, I think it's just a, a wealth of um, knowledge and emotion in those presentations and history and aren't we privileged to live in, in this amazing area and yeah. this piece of land has just had so much happen in it, the good and the bad and um, 
the huge, the calamitous and the wonderful. It's, it's an amazing piece of land that we're living next to.